Um, as always, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to contribute to the Friday Focus uh, series. And yes, really, today my job is quite simple, really. Um, the uh, Hunter and Argari displays are going through a complete makeover, and this is being orchestrated by my colleagues within the art um, team at the Hunter and Lola Sanchez Sororegui and uh, Joseph Tarpel. So um, I come in really as the curator who's been looking after the Scottish collection. Um, and what I intend to do today is just to place the Glasgow Boys and the Scottish Colouries within the context of this redisplay of the collection. So um, talk you through how they fit into the themes that are being um, tackled throughout the rooms uh, of the art gallery in this um, new interpretation. So first I will just give you a very brief overview of who the Glasgow boys and the Scottish chorus were. And then I'll just focus on a few works and I will try not to go overboard. And I have written some notes for myself because when I tried to do it freelance, I was blabbing away Way. And after only two paintings, I had taken all the time that I had. So you'll have to forgive me for having notes here just to keep myself in check, really. Um, so the Glasgow Boys and the Scottish Chorus are among the best known um, artists uh, when, uh, in um, British art when it comes to the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, I'll just give you a quote from a critic um, dating from 1888, commenting on the rise of the Glasgow Boys, just to give you an idea of how people felt about them at the time. And he said, of this young Glasgow school, there is enough to show that we have to do with the most important contemporary movement in Scottish, perhaps even British art. Glasgow has here an opportunity of becoming a great center of art. So it's it's no small claim, but I think it is actually really rather true. Um, it's in the beginning of the late seven, eight, late 1870s, early uh, 1880s, that a group of young artists who were mainly coming from the west coast of Scotland started to attract the attention of the British art world with works that were really rejecting the formulaic landscapes and narrative subjects of late Victorian Scottish painting. Many of them had gone to France to study and they worked actually for a year or two at a time in the Paris studio system. They also went to visit the rural artist colonies that were kind of burgeoning all around Paris and along the Brittany coast as well. And they kind of called themselves the boys as a, as a way of um, implying that they weren't part of the older generation. There was, there was a kind of a fresh, rebelling young generation coming in. And then Glasgow came in because they were, when they came back from having studied on the continent, they settled in Glasgow um, around two artists in particular, James Patterson and William York McGregor, who were kind of the father figure of the Glasgow boys, slightly older. They already had studios established in Glasgow. So it was very natural for those young men when they came back to Glasgow to kind of gravitate around them. Their early style is really Really defined by a strong interest in rural realism and adult painting and French inspired tonal and compositional technique. And you can see on the left hand side of your screen, I've just inserted there one of our better known work from that period by the Glasgow Boys is by George Henry. It's called The Hedger in 1886. And it gives you a feel for that naturalistic interest um, of theirs, but also their very strong interest in light and, and color um, that is exemplif exemplified by that painting. By the time we got to the uh, late 1880s and early 1890s, they were starting, like many other European artists, to move towards the more decorative approach. And this is illustrated on your screen by a watercolor by James Patterson, one of the father figure of uh, the Glasgow Boys called Moniav, dated 1889. And I don't think I need to say much about it. You can see the kinds of the Japanese influence, um, the ways that he's using blocks of colors in order to define space. And next to it is a work by um, Edward Atkinson Hornell, which is painted a couple of years later called The Brook, which takes inspiration from Scottish folklore and traditional story making um, and deals with it in a very modern way for the time. Uh, you can see that there really isn't much attempt to try and represent reality anymore. It's very decorative and it's very much influenced by art from other uh, civilization than the Western civilization, in this instance, Japan in particular. The Hunter Inn is very lucky because it has one of the very best collection of works by the Glasgow Boys in the public collection. So um, we're really able to represent their movement rather well. 
very closely following in their footsteps. The Scottish Choristes are really the next generation of Scottish artists who uh, made an impact um, on the European art scene. Um, and if I was to define them, I would use one quote that is often uh, talked about when um, bringing the Scottish Choristes to the table by George Leslie Hunter, one of the members of that group who said, everyone must choose their own way and mine will be the way of color. And it's true of all the four artists from that movement. And, and there were basically Samuel John Peplow, John Duncan Ferguson, Francis Boileau Caddell and George Leslie Hunter. And their claim to fame is that they were key figures in the introduction of modern art to Britain and among the most forward thinking art British artists of the early 20th century. They studied in France, just like the Glasgow boys, but they were a more disparate group of artists. They kind of, they were individual friendships like Ferguson and Peplow met in Edinburgh in around 1900. They became really good friends. They spent a, a holiday, summer holiday painting painting summer holidays in France and elsewhere together. And then during the war, um, Peplo met Cattle and they became friends and Peplo introduced Cattle to Ferguson and Hunter was kind of in the periphery, known to them, but um, maybe developing a friendship with Ferguson, but not so close to the other two. And it's really dealers who brought them together in the 1920s because they could see a similarity in their style. And they thought that from a marketing point of view, they could sell them as the Scottish Cory. So that's how they came into being really. <clears throat> and again, and you can see a couple of examples of their works on the right side of your screen. There is an early work by Francis um, um, uh, but Carol uh, called Winter Nellis from the early 1900s, which uh, sort of uh, alludes to the importance of still life for this group of painters. They really revived uh, still life um, in Scotland and they made it popular again. And here Winter Nellis refers to the um, pairs that the artist has displayed uh, in a plate and that he painted. And you can see how um, it's an interest in light and in colors that is really influencing how he's approaching the paintings. There's a strong influence of French art. Manet in particular comes to mind. Um, and they're among the sort of works that made the Scottish chorus well known uh, in the 1900s. Um, the next stage was really to feed on the latest development in continental art to develop their own style. And on the far right of the screen, we've got an example of the sort of works that they produced. This is by George Lexi Hunter. It's showing houseboats at Baloch. It's dated from 1924. Um, and it encapsulates um, this interest in a kind of post-impressionism um, and artists like Matisse um, landscape in particular is uh, predominant in the work of all of the Scottish colorists. So this is a very brief introduction to those two important movements. Um, and they are really peppered throughout the new displays. Um, I think um, it's, um, it's fair to say that um, they, they, they work very well with the themes that have been uh, chosen uh, for to be explored in those new displays. So the first, oh, this is always doing this. If I don't use it, it's when it freezes. I want to move to the next slide. Right, there we go. The, the, the introduction bay is really a, a general uh, introduction bay. And my understanding is that the paintings will be hung quite close together. There will be no attempt really to tell a story. It's just to give a flavor for the uh, collections um, and an idea of what is lurking in the walls behind that first bay. Um, and I just picked two of the works that will be included there. So the first one is by William York McGregor. It's called The Cottage Garden Krell, and it's a very recent acquisition. We've actually never had it on show yet. It arrived during the uh, pandemic. Um, it was given to us by a um, friend of the Hunterian who I met him about 25 years ago when I started at the Hunterian. And he always said to me, I have this painting by my Gregor and it will come to the Hunterian when I'm no longer here. Unfortunately, he passed away. And so the painting is now with us. It hasn't even been photographed. It's on the list of works to be photographed. Um, and it will get done uh, very shortly. So this is why you have actually 
a photograph taken with my phone from a publication where the painting is. And it's really a great addition to the Glasgow uh, Boys uh, collection of works. William Mag York McGregor is one of the father figures. He's um, one of those two artists whose studio was used as a kind of meeting point by the Glasgow Boys uh, in the early 1880s. And he didn't study in France himself, but he was very aware of what was happening on the continent. And he was very interested by the approach that the Impressionists were taking um, in terms of study of the light. And he was fascinated by the impact of strong sunlight on shapes and forms and colors. And here is an example of the sort of work that he was producing in the early 1880s that was of great interest to the young artists who were around him. It's one of his most ambitious works from that period as well. And it depicts Krell, which is a small fishing village uh, in the East Nuke of Fife on the East coast of Scotland. And you can see how he's playing with the greens and then the typical colors of the um, tiles as well. And this interest in sort of um, domestic subject matters that have no pretension to be anything grand. This is just a cottage garden. And that was the kind of subjects that they really liked to focus at the time. They actually, the Glasgow boys ended up being nicknamed the cabbage painter because there were always cabbages in the forefront of their painting, which is not surprising. If you go to any cottage garden in Scotland to this day, there will be cabbage leaves in it. That's just one of the staple of the cottage garden. So it's quite fun, I think, in a way that they ended up being nicknamed after that. The painting next to it is by E.A. Hornell, who joined the Glasgow Boys movement a little later compared to most of the members. He arrived back in Scotland having studied in Antwerp around 1885, and he settled in Kirkabri, which is a small town on the, in the southwest of Scotland which ended up becoming an, a sort of artist uh, colony uh, a decade or so later. And here again, you can see how the minute he associates with the Glasgow boys, he starts taking this interest in the sort of depiction of uh, small um, gardens and rural activities. And he really picks on the ways that they um, tackle this subject matter, um, the use of the very strong sunlight to kind of um, slightly dissolve form and help them to, to come to an interpretation of the landscape that's not really based on imitation and is more an interpretation. It's a little difficult to see um, from the slide, but um, I don't know if you can see the reflection um, of the light on the varnish, which is actually helping the artist aim. He really wanted to give a physical rendering of the turning of uh, earth in the lower uh, part of the canvas because he'd just been at work in the garden and he wanted to suggest that. And he really used a palette knife in order to give um, movement to the actual medium. Uh, so he's not only using colors and perspective, he's also using his um, medium as a, almost like a clay to, to, to some degree to represent this uh, freshly churned Earth, Earth, sorry. <clears throat> and when we move away from the introduction, oh, well, no, I forgot, actually, in the introduction base, the Scottish chorus are represented as well, uh, of course. And at two of the works that really um, mark um, important moments in their careers have been included in that bay. The first one by Samuel John Peplo, called Tulips in a Pottery Vase, um, represents the artist at his most experimental. Um, by the time that Peplo painted this work, he was in Paris, he had decided to settle there and he lived there, immersing, immersing himself in the uh, culture of the city for about three or four years. And that's painted during that period. And it shows how he was really paying attention to what was happening around him. He's really interested in the theories developed by the Cubists in terms of interpretation of space. He's also interested by what the full movement was doing, which was um, looking at colors and how they can help you to um, create an emotional response to the landscape in front of you. And he's mixing those two together. So there's a bit of cubism, a bit of fauvism, and then his own very personal um, interpretation of what those two movements are about. And it's all about light. Uh, it's all about different ways of representing perspective. And it's all about finding new ways of um, defining what art is about. Um, and this kind of experiment lasted for about two or three years, and then people would move on and, and develop a slightly different style, but it's a very important seminal painting. It's always borrowed by anyone who does an exhibition on the Scottish Colorist and now the Fauve as well uh, across Europe. The one next to it is by John Duncan Ferguson and it's called Le Voile Persan, the Persian Veil. It's dated from 1909. Um, by that time, 
Ferguson had been living in Paris for a couple of years and like Peplo, he was really embracing what was happening around him. In fact, he was part of it because he became one of the leader of a movement called L'Ecole de Paris, which brought together artists who went from Paris um, and who were really kind of uh, getting close to um, the latest uh, movements. That, and they, they were really definitely interested in the avant-garde. They just wanted to change the world. They wanted to change art. And here we can see Ferguson playing around with contemporary interest around um, anything exotic, um, but also um, the relationship in between figure and background. And it shows the beginning of his um, evolution towards treating the female figure in particular as part of an ensemble rather than as, as a subject in itself. So here we don't really know where the woman stops and the background starts and she's wearing a floral um, scarf around her neck, which is kind of blending with a veil that's in the background and it creates a very different way of approaching the interpretation of the female figure. Um, we also know that this woman happened to be his mistress at the time, one of the women that he moved to Paris with. So that throws an interesting um, kind of um, light on, on the painting and what it may have meant to the artist. But there'll be none of that in that first day because this is really about putting those paintings on the wall and letting you enjoy them uh, for yourself with no interpretation. The, the next room as that I will look at is uh, materials and art making and the aim of that room really is uh, just to explore the way art is produced and to present a variety of technique and different stages in the creative process. Um, when it comes to the Glasgow Boys, there are many examples that would be suitable, but that particular one is great because um, in their use, the Glasgow Boys um, executed several drawings, caricatures and informal sketches that capture their outdoor excursion. And we're very lucky to have one of the best one here. And it's a great way of reminding our visitors of what it means to paint outside. So you can see here that um, the painter has a small easel, which he probably would have folded and put on his backpack on his back as he was walking through the countryside to find uh, suitable subjects and he has a small panel and that's quite characteristic of works that are painted out of doors at least at this time uh, where they tend to be quite small works just for practical reason. The sunshade is a reminder that the Glasgow boys were really interested in painting in really strong sunlight so they needed some kind of protection because otherwise they wouldn't really be able to work on their painting so um, it's just um, an important element of their um, paraphernalia. And then I find quite charming the rather substantial picnic that you can see on the foreground of the picture. And it tells us he was not on his own. And we know that they tended to go in groups of three or four. And sometimes um, they would just leave at uh, sunrise and come back at sunset or in the middle of the night. There are accounts of them kind of trolling through the countryside in the dark, trying not to fall over as they were going back to their lodging. So this painting really encapsulates as uh, that um, in a very um, charming way. And I just included a, a, a photograph of a uh, cattle um, 40 years later painting on Iona. Um, we see artists, you know, on, on the side of the road who are busy capturing a scene in front of them as well. So that's something that's um, that we take for granted, but it didn't happen until about 200 years ago in, in, in that way anyway. Um, the next room that um, includes a few works by the Glasgow Boys and the Scottish Corys is what makes a portrait. Um, and that room explains what the tradition, traditional um, understanding of uh, a portrait is, which is roughly a representation of a specific person, at least in Western art. Uh, but then it goes on to consider uh, what else do portraits do? And they do uh, much more. And this is what this room is about. It's about thinking about what makes a portrait and to whom and, and why and how. Um, and it includes several works by uh, John Duncan Ferguson, which is not surprising. Ferguson, among all of the artists that I'm talking about today, is the one who really paid most attention to uh, the human figure, particularly the female human figure, but the human figure um, overall. Um, and um, the, this room includes uh, this sculpture. Um, and it's, it's just uh, looking at it, um, 
from the point of view of a work of art. So it's it's named after the Saxon goddess of spring, Estra. And at first, it does not seem to have much to do with portraiture, as, um, more with allegory, the, the title, and also the quote from the artist that is included on your screen that reads, the head is composed entirely of sections of a sphere, the forehead is round, the eyes are round, the cheeks round, hairs represented by two pads to show the sun's triumph after the gloom of winter, tells us very clearly what the intention of the artist is. Um, it, um, it, it really um, refers to his aim to experiment with the female form and also with his intention to refer to ideas around fertility, the renewal of life after winter, the importance of the sun in the cycle of life, etc., etc. Um, the sculpture in itself also clearly hints at the fact that the artist had obviously absorbed ideas coming from different cultures, such as a bold stylized lines of tribal and Celtic art in particular. Um, so you could ask um, why the sculpture has been included in this room dedicated to portraiture. Um, and we do know that uh, um, the sculpture was inspired by Ferguson's wife, Margaret Morris, uh, who was a dancer, the leader of a dance school and an artist in her own right. And I included this little article from a contemporary um, who's who um, that shows a picture of his wife uh, or partner. We don't know whether they were married, uh, as well as a little biography to give you an idea of what she was about. Um, and for Ferguson, Margaret personified the modern woman, sophisticated yet in touch with primeval forces. So whilst the artist is not intending for the sculpture to be read as a representation of a specific person, the work itself, from the ideas behind its conception to its actual appearance, all much to Margaret's essence to what she means or represents to him. So does that make it a portrait? I think this is the kind of question that the room wants to bring to the table and, and wants the visitors to engage with so that they can make up their own mind as to what actually a portrait is. The next room is around color and light, art and science. Um, and it focuses on how technical transformations in science and art influenced each other in the last decades of the 19th century in Europe. It starts with the French Impressionists, who have become the best known exponents of that growing desire among contemporary artists to paint what they saw and felt when observing nature. The French Impressionists and Impressionists in general were not interested in accurately recording appearances, and their main subject matter really was a capture of an impression, that of a landscape, a thing or a person, at a certain moment and under a certain light. I borrowed that from the text panels as I will go in the actual displays, uh, So, um, because I, I, I'm, I'm aware that I'm giving my own interpretation of what my colleagues have been doing. So uh, at times I thought I would anchor myself with what actually they have said about the new displays. Um, so I think having heard this, it will come as no surprise to you when I say that the Glasgow boys and the Scottish chorus are very present in this room. And I've selected just a few examples of the kind of works you can expect to find there. And my screen is going to do this annoying thing where it switches off. Uh, so I'm going to do it now before it does it. And then I'll come back on. So I'll keep on talking whilst that is that, but you will have a blank screen for maybe five seconds. Okay, bear with me. I'm sorry about that. Um, I don't know how to stop this from happening. It would be great, but never mind. So on your screen, when it comes back, which should be now, great, we have a work by George Henry called Sundown, which is dated from 1887. And it's here to highlight the interest that there was at that time in capturing how different lights would impact on what the artist was looking at or what we are looking at ourselves when we are out there in the countryside or in out of doors. <clears throat> and sunlight, sundown, and nighttime were really um, particular moment that uh, artists were finding uh, fascinating because of its ability to dissolve form and uh, because of the challenge in trying to capture those impressions. It, there was no point in trying to be realistic in the way that they were capturing it. So they had to devise 
different methods of doing that. And the George Henry Sandan captures that very nicely. The painting next to it is by Bessie McNichol, um, who was a very talented uh, young woman who become part of the, a group called the Glasgow Girls. They were kind of affiliated with the Glasgow boys. Um, and um, unfortunately her career was cut short because she died giving uh, birth only four years after this painting was executed. And it's a great shame because she really is among the most talented painters of her generation. And here we can see her uh, experimenting with the effects that gaslight has on subject matter. So this uh, woman is shown strongly lit uh, by gaslight and, and that's what she's exploring um, there. Um, Laser by John Duncan Ferguson is one of the star paintings from the Hunterian collection. Um, and it is, I don't think I need to say much, it is obviously an aim to color and light. And I thought I could talk about that painting for an hour and a half. So I thought rather than just start down that road, um, I, it would be better to just um, give Ferguson's own voice as to why he was so interested in, in working with uh, light and color. And here you can see the quote where everyone in Scotland should refuse to have anything to do with black or dirty and digi colors and insist on clean colors in everything. I remember when I was young, any color was considered a sign of vulgarity. Grays and blacks were the only colors for people of taste and refinement. Good pictures had to be black, gray, brown, or drab. Well, let's forget it and insist on things in Scotland being of color that makes for and associates itself with light, hopefulness, health, and happiness. So I think it's a lovely quote. And it's also a reminder that colors could be seen as vulgar and that we maybe forget today when we look back at their work, how um, daring they would have seemed at the, sign, at, at the time, sorry. Um, and then we have works by um, um, Francis Campbell uh, Boileau Caddle. Um, there is a series of paintings executed by the Scottish Corys on Iona, which um, are uh, very much loved by anyone who knows those artists. Iona is a small island, part of the Inner Hebrides on the west coast of Scotland. And for anyone who's interested in light, it has magical properties. The sand is made of crushed shells that really reflect light. The rocks have huge amount of minerals that also have reflective qualities. The light is pure and, and quite cold and gold at the same time. So it's hot and warm at the same time. It's changing constantly because it's exposed to the element um, out in the Atlantic Sea. And you have in the background the kind of outline of the islands. And it's it just makes for a mesmerizing place. And Cadell and um, Peplo are two of the artists who in the 1920s would religiously every summer go and spend some time on Iona. And it helped them to really uh, free themselves from um, convention and to work really quickly to capture the changing effects in front of them. And it, it makes for a very endearing series of painting in beautiful colors. If you're in a bad mood, just look at it for two minutes and it's enough to really cheer you up. So uh, I think that should be recommended in terms of mental well-being actually as some things that we should all have on our wall, even if it's a postcard. And next to it is Still Life and Rose Hotel, also by Cattle which was painted roughly at the same time as this uh, view of the Catholic Cathedral Rock on Iona was painted. And I've included it next to the, to the, um, the landscape and the still life to show the very different approaches that artists would develop to tackle their subject matter, depending on where they were. So one is outside, open to the element. The other one is inside. The light is controlled. Everything about what you see has been controlled by the artist, how things are positioned, the um, reflective quality of the surfaces that he chooses to paint. And what's particularly interesting in that painting is that if you can see it yourself, you will see how the painting has used the actual medium to emphasize the colors that and the um, effects that he wishes to capture. So here it's all about reflection. And in the middle of the painting, the paint has got more oil included in it and it's applied in a thicker way to try and really highlight that kind of highly glossed effect. 
um, by contrast, in the painting of Iona, where there are the, all the mineral qualities of the island means that it has a quite a chalky appearance. The artist prepared his ground, taking away all the oil, and he took away the oil from his paint as well as much as he could. So he could achieve that kind of chalky appearance that captures what the island is about. So it's quite interesting to look at those. Um, and then the, the last room I'm going to talk about, and I know I've already, well, I'm in danger of running over my allocated time, but I'll, I'll, I'll whiz through those last few sites. Art across the borders, courts abroad. I've already mentioned how interested in what was happening on the continent, the Glasgow Boys and the Scottish Corys were. So they figure heavily in that room. Um, and they take us um, across to Japan, which is the furthest away um, place, I think, included in that room in terms of works represented in the hand-to-hand, and also across uh, Europe, you know, from France to uh, the Netherlands to Italy, Greece, um, and North Africa as well, actually. Um, and the first one that I, um, I included here is a work by... Um, E. A. Hornell, who together with another Glasgow boy, uh, George Henry, was actually sponsored to go to Japan. Japan seems to have fascinated the Western world in the, well, he didn't seem to, was fascinating to the Western world in the late uh, 19th century, um, as exchanges uh, were really uh, starting to um, become more commercial in, in nature in some way, I suppose. Um, and there was great admiration for the art of Japan among Western artists, and Henry and Hornell were given money by a dealer and a patron to go and spend a year in Japan. And it was to furnish Hornell with uh, subject matter for the rest of his career, really. When there, Hornell became part of a uh, Japanese photographic society, and he started to collect a lot of photographs um, and take some himself, which he brought back in his studio. And they can actually be seen today at Broughton House, which is a property managed by the National Trust for Scotland and was Hornell's house uh, during the last 30 years of his life. And you can see here the, the painting that will be on show called Two Geisha and the kind of uh, photograph that was um, behind the inspiration for their composition at times for the artist. So some of the paintings that he executed in Japan, he just would do um, because he saw something that caught his eye and others were really inspired by those photographs. So it's quite interesting to see in that context. <clears throat> Artists didn't only go abroad because they were keen to experience for themselves an art that they had become fascinated with or because they wanted to put themselves in a new environment that would um, kind of entice them to be more creative or to experiment or to be out of their comfort zone. Sometimes it had to do with ill health as well. And this was a case for William York McGregor, who, um, when he um, was in his 40s, that started to have real uh, sort of um, pulmonary um, issues um, and his uh, difficulties in breathing. And he was advised to go and live abroad. Um, and he moved to the south of France to start with. And then eventually um, he made his way to North Africa. And here are a couple of views uh, from his time in the south of France, north of Spain, <clears throat> in the Basque country, uh, Fuente Arabia and Saint Jean de Luz. And I included next to that the kind of small work that uh, inspired uh, William McGregor, the Glasgow Boys in general, and later the, the Scottish uh, colorist, um, works produced by Whistler which are very well represented in the collection. And next to it is one of Whistler's paint box. Just to give you an idea of the sort of box that artists would carry around at the time with those little panels that would slit at the bottom of the box. And they're exactly the same dimension as the works that you see on the scale. So you can picture the artist in the street in Fuente Arabia or saint jean de Luz with its uh, portable um, sort of mini easel kind of, um, you know, capturing those scenes um, as they go along the streets. Uh, of those cities. Um, it's exactly the same thing that happened in Paris uh, with artists like Peplo and Ferguson. They too would have had those little boxes that they were carrying around with them and stopped whenever something caught their attention. So we've got a work by Samuel John Peplo, A Paris Street, a little work by John Duncan Ferguson, which is not included in the exhibition, but that I brought in because it's, it's just part of the, the set of works that uh, those were doing. And I've included also um, drawings, which are not going to be in the exhibition. They're works on paper, but by Jessie M. King, who was um, a friend of John Duncan Ferguson and Samuel John Peplo. She was married to E.A. Taylor, another friend of theirs. And she's part of the group of Scottish artists that settled 
in Paris in the years before World War I um, and who was sketching in the streets and painting in the streets all the time. Um, and we could actually do an exhibition if we wanted to around those views of Paris at the Hentena. So it was really to highlight the richness of the collection in that area. Um, and then we will finish with that slide, which is uh, capturing uh, the Scottish colorists moving south. Um, as they were really getting to grip with what was going on in Paris um, before the war, um, they became aware of the fact that the artist colonies that they were familiar with, which were around Paris in Normandy and uh, you know along um, the, the coast of the North Sea, um, were um, actually moving south, first to Royan, which is uh, in Brittany, and then further south to the southeast of France in particular, in places like Cassis and Port de Vendre and so on and so forth. And they followed because they were very interested to experience for themselves the kind of very strong light um, that had that kind of dissolving effect on the landscape would do to them and to their art. And you can see here how they experimented with different approach. And I couldn't resist including um, uh, a photograph of the Église Saint-Michel Cassis, which is represented by uh, Peplo in his painting of Cassis, just to give you an idea of that kind of light that they were playing around with. And I have spoken for far too long, so I will stop here and I'm very happy to answer any question you may have. Thank you.